Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Sons of History. It is great to be back. Alan, I am so sorry that I missed you last week. You did great, though. No, thanks. Uh, I, I had a good time, but, you know, I got to tell you, it, uh, I felt like Ed McMahon or Paul Schaefer running a show, and it just, eh, you know, it didn't seem didn't seem right. So I needed, uh, I needed Johnny Carson. I needed David Letterman. I was going to say, I have never been paid a higher compliment than being compared to Johnny Carson or David Letterman. Wow. That's what, that's what I felt like. So I was like, yeah, imagine watching a show with Ed McMahon. Okay. And, uh, you know, he did, uh, Uh, yeah. Star search, right? He did star search, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did. But you know, I never watched that show. Yeah, he, isn't that what it was called? I think it was Star Search or something, but it wasn't really him that was the star of the show. It was all the talent that came on. And like, I don't mean that, <laughs> I don't mean that in a, a roundabout way as far as talent goes. We know that you are the talent of this show. I'm just here yeah. to present. Hey, do, you know, it's all right because, you know, quarterback's not a good quarterback unless he's got a good wide receiver. So, you know, there you go. Amen to that, or a good offensive line. Yeah, that that too, as we can see with the Texans. Not that I've been watching them lately, because their little politics, they need to snap out of that before I start watching them again. Yeah, they're a joke, but they've been a joke of an organization for a long time. But speaking of like having no wide receivers and no offensive line, poor David Carr, when he came into the league with the Texans, it was just like, you know, there were commercials that made jokes about it, and he was in those commercials. So that's how bad that was. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, welcome to the Sons of History podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to our show on YouTube if you're over there. And if you aren't uh, watching and you're just listening, if you're listening like on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, subscribe wherever you're listening. But do us a favor, leave a rating and a review, preferably, obviously, five stars and some very kind words, if not for me, at least for Alan. Alan is... He's the guy. He's the guy who makes everything because he's here to make sure that we stay on track and the information that is provided is correct. Um, I know a little bit, but not nearly in comparison to my good friend, Alan. So also uh, visit our website, thesenseofhistory.com. Go check out some of our gear as well. Um, And we are streaming now on Epic TV. Uh, It's really good stuff. And speaking of... uh, American Essence is part of the Epic Times, Alan. My very first piece came out. Uh, you read it the other day. I sent it over to you about John Paul Jones, the battle between uh, the Von Hammer Shard and the Serapis. Really, um, that was a fun piece to, to write. What did you think about it? Did you enjoy it? I liked it because I've been a John Paul Jones fan. I went and visited a, a home he lived in when I was in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So, um, guy, the guy had balls. He really knew how to take the fight to, uh, the British. So, you know, and, and they were, uh, all pissed off at him and wanting to, uh, treat him as a pirate rather than a uh, worthy opponent. So kudos to the man. He, he did a great job and, uh, you know, and he, and, you know, he was British or I think from Scotland. So, uh, more kudos to him right there. More kudos to him. Yeah, he was a bad man. Um, and American Essence is a magazine by the Epic Times. It's, dude, I, like this is my first copy, and it is a beautiful magazine. They did a fantastic job um, with my article. Um, gave me about eight pages. They did. They just did a wonderful job. So I just wanted to put a shout out there. Uh, speaking of Epic TV, uh, my documentary on the JFK Jr. crash came out about a week ago, maybe a little more. So if you want to know what really happened to JFK Jr., I recommend that you go watch that incredible documentary. So, uh, oh, and speaking of, what are you? Hold on, what are you doing? Well, remember when we uh, were on our little uh, uh, Fredericksburg Denison trip? We, went, we visited the Ivanhoe Ale Works, so I'm, you know, after last week, you know, I really enjoyed having a drink during the, uh, during the podcast last week, so I decided, you know, I'm going to drink this. This is uh, the Red River Ale. I think it's like one of their, uh, one of their uh, you know, good beers, so. <laughs> one of their good beers. Yeah, I remember really enjoying their beers over there, but yeah, you have, I don't want to say that you got a drinking problem, but you have a problem 
with drinking. No, I, I, I think I drink it very well, and I, I, I drink nothing but the best. You know, I get some good stuff. I, you know, but uh, hey, you know what? I, I've got a whole. You know, I used to be a bartender. I have a whole liquor cabinet, but I don't drink that often. I only, uh, you know, during the weekday, I'm good. Sunday night, I'm good. But you know, Friday, Saturday night, hey, why not? But you know, one or two drinks the most. Alan, this is, I mean, the more we do this show, the more I find out about you. I actually had, and we've known each other for quite some time now, I had no idea you were a bartender. I was a bartender. I was a bartender. Didn't last very long, but... uh, (laughs) Wasn't very good, but... (laughs) Hey, you know, it wasn't because of, uh, it wasn't because of my, my aptitude or my ability to make drinks. I think it was more of my attitude, so... Oh, man. Yeah, I worked... I, wor- I worked at uh, this golf club that was exclusive. It was called Lockenvar Golf Club, and it was uh, like the richest of the rich played there. Uh, former President George H. W. Bush, he was a member. So, uh, yeah, I was there for a bit, you know, and uh, got to. I, well, what, what was that guy's name? That shark guy. Uh, he won the British Open, I think, in '92. Greg that's, Norman. That's, yeah, that's that's when I was there. 90, no, '93, '93. That's when I was there in '93. And uh, Butch Harmon, the pro, he was the pro there, and uh, he he worked for uh, what was that guy, T- Tiger Woods. Okay. Man. So anyway, we're going down a rabbit hole here. But anyway, yeah, so enjoying the beer, but and, and it ties in ties in with our trip to Fredericksburg and Denison. That it does. That it does. If you haven't gone there, you you need to go to both those places. Check out uh, also our documentary on our YouTube channel. Yeah, um, I've got my own uh, documentary that I'm working on. Um, it's, uh, going to be the Gulf Coast campaign. Um, I interviewed, uh, Kenneth Ramagost who, uh, located where the actual fort was in Baton Rouge. And also I interviewed these two gentlemen here, Mike Bunn, who wrote 14th Colony and Wesley Odom, who wrote a book on the siege of Pensacola, which was the longest siege of the Revolutionary War. So, uh, I am working on the, the documentaries on those. So, uh, yeah. Well, speaking of finding the fort where that took place, we're actually going to be talking to a guy, Michael Livingston, who actually um, is going to be discussing the actual location of the Battle of Creasy. The famous- now, before we do that, I wanted to ask you real quick, um, how was your uh, interview over in the um, New York, WABC? How'd that go? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it actually didn't go, at least the first time around. Yeah, didn't, uh, you fall asleep or something? <laughs> I didn't fall asleep. You were I asleep. I was asleep. And the show started, I was supposed to be on at 2.30 Central Time AM, and it was Tuesday night, like we were, I was going to be on Tuesday night. Well, I was thinking Tuesday night, not Monday morning. Um, so I was just dead asleep and then I wake up the next day, uh, Tuesday, I wake up and I've missed seven phone calls, got an email and they're like, Hey, trying to get a hold of you. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So I apologize to Frank Morano, the host of the WABC show out in New York city. I was like, dude, I'm an idiot. Um, I also, no- I also noticed, uh, you didn't mention my name. You just said your partner or something like that. And I'm like going, Hmm. You know, last week's episode, I did mention Dustin's name a few times, but... Well, it is our show. It could have been, my name could have been mentioned on WABC in New York City. People could have heard about it. Look, man, here's the thing. If you listened to that interview, I even told the guy, I was like, dude, I'm sorry. I I was a train wreck. I was so nervous on that one. Like, if there was a camera on, I would have just been like... There was so much that I left out. Like, my personal Ed McMahon, I apologize. My personal Paul Schaefer, I apologize. But, dude, there was so much that I left out and just didn't remember, I felt. I had the shakes, so I apologize. But, yeah, you you can go check it out. Nonetheless. So, anyway, all right, let's talk uh, a little bit of uh, the Battle of Cressy. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about that. Um, One of the famous battles from the Hundred Years' War. Uh, This book was really good. Um... Very enjoyable. This is like big time guy, man. Michael Livingston's big time. Um, we're going to be talking to him soon. But I think before we get to that, let's how about we just do uh, This Week in History? Let's do it. 
All right, so mine is going to be October 22nd of 1962. Actually, you can look, really look at the whole week, but I want to concentrate on that one because that was the day that President John F. Kennedy addressed the nation that we were on the verge of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Uh, President Kennedy ad addressed the nation, uh, telling them that they discovered offensive weaponry, in this case, nuclear weapons, that the Soviets placed in Cuba. Now, how in the hell did this happen? Well, you know, in, in uh, New Year's Day of 1959, the uh, president of Cuba, Batista, he quit because the uh, communists, Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Che Guevara, they were winning uh, the battles to take over uh, Cuba. So Batista quit. If you watch the movie uh, Godfather 2, you'll see that part of the, uh, where he, you know, during a New Year's celebration where he quits, uh, quits the regime. So, um, so yeah, Kennedy came on. And one of the things, if you go to like around uh, somewhere between the 10 to the 11 minute mark, this is what he says, which kind of freaked a lot of people out. He said, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Wow. So, uh, so what happened was uh, we... Um, you know, against the uh, against the rulings of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, we imposed a quarantine, not a blockade, which is an act of war, but a quarantine. So ships can, you know, blockade means nothing gets in. But with a quarantine, ships can go in, but they have to be inspected to make sure that there were no nuclear weapons uh, on board. Um, now, the first ship that was that was uh, uh, boarded was actually a, a Lebanese freighter of all things called the uh, Maru Maruchia or Marusia. So that was the first ship that was uh, boarded. Um, you know, the, it there was a lot of tension. We had a U-2 spy plane that got shot down. Uh, Major uh, Rudolf Anderson was killed. There were a lot of Navy aircraft that were shot at. And this was against the wishes of uh, Premier Khrushchev. Uh, but the, but the Cubans, they, the, the Cuban communists, they wanted to, they, they wanted a fight, basically. They really did want to fight. So we mobilized. I mean, I mean, this was a full-time mobilization. Uh, we had nuclear weapons ready. We had uh, 82nd Airborne. They, they went down to the Florida area. I mean, we were getting ready for war. Um, now, you know, a lot of people thought that this could be a trade-off, uh, you know, Soviets will say, we'll give you Cuba, you give us Berlin, that type of thing. You know, Andre Gromyko, the foreign minister, was denying everything. Kennedy was, Kennedy had read the book called The Guns of August, so he was afraid that if we were to start some sort of a war, that this could just cover the whole, cover the whole world, that, that the whole world would get involved and we would have a, we'd really have a third world war. I mean, so, you know, Robert Kennedy warned uh, the Soviet ambassador uh, his name was uh, Dobr Dobrynin, that the gloves will come off if there's any shooting, if we have any planes shot down. We're going to take out every SAM missile base in, in Cuba. We're going to take out all the offensive weaponry. That would, be the, that would just be a war with the Soviet Union. So now what we didn't know, fortunately, everything was resolved peaceably. We, we went to the United Nations. We went to the Organization of American States. Um, what we didn't realize was that there were already over 150 nukes in Cuba, plus there were submarines that had, um, you know, capabilities to launch nukes. It was a close one, but, you know, the United States didn't really feel it. The American people didn't really feel it until October 22nd when President Kennedy addressed the nation. Hmm. Yeah, tense times. Speaking of tense times it's what we're living in right now speaking of america and well at least the former soviet union wild stuff the threat of nuclear war yeah something definitely to remember that's that was a good yeah, choice i think i think that was more of a threat than what's going on with russia i mean we can right right i i, I don't see i don't see us going to uh, i don't see a nuclear exchange with russia I, I just don't see that um 
there, there's going to be problems in the long term. I think if anything, though, there will be some sort of like sabotage computers, computer viruses. I think that's how there's fighting is going to be. But, you know, Putin, Putin's not a stupid man. He knows that he cannot win a nuclear war with NATO. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Well, my selection is October 23rd, 1642. This is the Battle of Edge Hill. Now, this was the first major battle of the English Civil War. This war began because the king, Charles I, was not a real big fan of parliament and his restrictions on power. He wanted to take some of those powers back and be like king, king. Um, not a fan of the parliament. Um, so the battle takes place at Edge Hill in South Warwickshire, uh, where the royalists led by Charles I and his nephew, Prince Rupert, not Rupert Murdoch, he was not alive at the time. Uh, they fought against the parliamentarians who were led by Robert Devereux, which is an awesome last name, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Now, both sides were pretty evenly matched. Uh, there was about 30,000 soldiers involved in the battle. After the battle, which actually started late, around 2 p.m. and only lasted for a few hours, uh, there was about 1,000 soldiers that were killed and about 2,000 more that were injured. So the battle evenly matched uh, and so evenly matched that it sort of is considered a draw between the two sides as uh, the Earl of Wessex withdrew to Warwick and he ended up leaving the path open to London for Charles I. But the king ended up only getting to reading, not reading Pennsylvania, different place, different continent. Uh, well, technically, uh, Britain's not a continent, right? It's just an isle. Anyways, uh, so the Earl and his soldiers were able to regroup. Now, in a way, this battle was actually fought twice. Check this out, Alan. Just before Christmas 1642, the first sighting of a ghostly reenactment was reported by some shepherds as they walked across the battlefield. They reported hearing voices and the screams of horses, the clash of armor and the cries of the dying and said they had seen a ghostly reenactment of the battle in the night sky. They reported it to a local priest and it is said that he too saw the phantoms of the fighting soldiers. Indeed, there were so many sightings of the battle by the villagers of Kenneton in the days that followed that a pamphlet called A Great Wonder in Heaven detailing the ghostly goings on was published in January 1643. Wild stuff. That comes from history-uk.com, um, that little tidbit. Now, we know how this civil war ends. It ends about seven years later with the execution of the king. And then you have Oliver Cromwell, uh, Cromwell come in. But he was executed on January 30th, 1649. That is my This Week in History. Hey, what um, you think, which side would you have been on? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Probably I would have, well, I don't know because it would be like, okay, am I used to being a parliament, like loving the parliamentarian side um, and pushing for more or less a republic version of government? Or would I be like, hey, I think kings are the best way to do things. So I, I don't know. That's That's a tough one. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. So, yeah. All right. Well, that is This Week in History. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we've got a awesome, awesome guest. I am thrilled uh, to have him on the show, uh, Michael Livingston. He is the Secretary General for the U.S. Commission on Military History, and he also teaches at the Citadel, which is uh, one of the nation's six senior military academies. He's also the author of several works, including Never Greater Slaughter, uh, Brennan Burr and the Birth of England, The Battle of Creasy, a casebook which actually won the Distinguished Book Award uh, from the Society for Military History, and his latest book, which we'll primarily be talking about, Creasy, Battle of Five Kings. Uh, this was an this is a really, really good book. And if you are fans of the Hundred Years' War, you know a lot about it, you need to read this book and it'll um, adjust maybe some of the some of the way that you some of the ways that you look at uh, the Hundred Years War and specifically the Battle of Creasy. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have Michael Livingston on the line. Very excited to have him. Michael, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are y'all? We're good. I'm good. 
Um, listen, I wanted to mention real quick before we get into this discussion, uh, because I know that there's a lot of people who are not that familiar with the Hundred Years' War. So um, one of the things I always like to tell people is, is if you are a fan of the movie Braveheart, um, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, um, Edward II, now that was the son of Longshanks, the one that was married to Isabella of France. They were the parents of Edward III. Now, Isabella had three brothers. They were all children of uh, Philip IV, also known as Philip the Fair. That is why the Hundred Years' War took place, because the three brothers all died, and Edward III, son of Isabella, was like, hey, I should be the king of France, and, you know, so th that's, that is pretty much how the Hundred Years' War came about, because, they felt, because he felt that he should be the king, uh, even though he was the, um, the son of a princess of France. Um, if you watch the movie The Knight's Tale, Edward, the Black Prince, was in that movie. He was a big figure in the Hundred Years' War. He was the son of Edward III. He was, he was the heir to the throne. Um, he, he unfortunately dies before that happens, and Richard II came in, and he became the king after Edward III died, and that's what eventually everything led to the Wars of the Roses. You also had Joan of Arc who fought in this war. You had Henry V. Uh, you had interruptions like the Black Plague came in and uh, put a stop to much of the fighting. And the Hundred Years' War was not really 100 years long. It was from 1337 to 1453, which was the same year that Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. So... Hopefully you have an idea of, of a little bit more and appreciation for the Hundred Years' War. And so let's, uh, let's uh, take it away, uh, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Livingstone, I presume? <laughs> you presume correctly. I do have a PhD. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, and speaking of Braveheart, uh, that'll lead me to my first question, Mike. Um, Braveheart, would you call that a historically accurate movie or the most historically accurate movie? That's a hard, it is historically one of the most historically inaccurate movies. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's trash in terms of history. It's really, really bad. Uh, but I mean, it's fun. I, I, you know, I enjoyed it like when I was younger, uh, and ignorant, I, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's, it's really, it's really well done for what it is, but, uh, anybody who walks away from that thinking I, they know how to even wear a kilt, uh, is misled. Well, yeah. Cause, cause William Wallace, he died, uh, when Isabella was, what, seven years old, and uh, I don't think they got married. Edward and uh, Isabella didn't get married until she was 12. So, you know, a few years it's, off there. I don't it's, think... It's uh, bad. It's bad. Yeah. Like, everything about that's bad. Uh, but, you know, again, it's it's beautiful. And, you know, the way, I, the way I think about this stuff is, look, I love the Middle Ages. Uh, obviously, I love military history, and that's my kind of kind of bag. Uh, but anything that gets people excited about about this kind of stuff that gets them into my classes where I can explain to them what's wrong with it. Uh, well, that's fine. It got them into my class and that's, you know, the kind of the important thing. Yeah. For me, it's almost like uh, Lizzo playing James Madison's uh, flute. I loved that. That was great. Yeah. It's like, Hey, you know, that was great. I'm like that, you know, not that I know squat about her music or whatever, but right. But I was, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I said. I said, you uh, look, somebody posted like a history, uh, somebody on Instagram, like they, they do a history show. And I was like, look, if it introduces people to James Madison, uh, who have never heard of him, I'm pretty much all for it. That's right. That's right. Well, Hey man. Uh, so I want, we want to talk about your, your new book. Um, it's crazy, man. Um, yeah, I'm learning how to say that crazy, uh, battle of five Kings. Now I, I do want to get into your case book as well. Um, and it's probably going to be my first question. How did you even come across sort of the discrepancy of, you know, let's walk this battlefield. And then we have found some things that apparently nobody else has, has brought up before. Yeah. So that's a great question. You know, this came about because I, I went on a, on a trip, uh, with a couple colleagues, uh, Kelly DeVries and, uh, Robert Wisdom Savage. We we were going to Northern France and the main target actually was, was the battle of Agincourt. Uh, I had just been working on Owen Glendur, who's a, uh, Welsh rebel, kind of like the, he actually is sort of like the Welsh Braveheart. 
uh, only he never gets caught and he's not a putz uh, the way William Moss was. So working on a book on this and it, and it gave, I had this idea that uh, Henry V had learned a specific tactic from the Welsh and that he had done this at the field of Agincourt. And so, uh, you know, these two buddies of mine, you know, both academics, both medievalists, we said, let's go find out, right? Let's just go together. Let's go to Agincourt, you know, check the field out and see if, if Mike's theory holds any water. And uh, it took uh, five, five minutes maybe uh, to figure out that my theory held no water whatsoever. Um, it was, it was a good time. Uh, completely destroyed my idea. But just down the road is the uh, site, uh, the traditional site of the Battle of Crecy. And uh, Kelly DeVries, uh, who, was, who was there with us, said, uh, you know, well, let's go down the road. I've got a, I have some questions about that site that, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So we went down and walk in the field. We spent the day walking the field, the traditional site. And, you know, I, I came away, you know, Kelly, my friend was absolutely right. You know, there was problems with it but they were disastrous problems. Like the more that we walked the field, the more I was convinced, like just this isn't a thing where we need to like rotate the battle or something, you know, like if we just turn it a little bit, it's going to work. It was like this, it's not here. Like nothing about this makes sense. And that's what made me dive into, you know, let's, let's get the sources together. Let's find out what there is and see what it tells us, because I don't think it's here. And, um, and Kelly then, uh, you know, we partnered together in doing the the crazy casebook uh, that you mentioned, which has all the sources in it. And that was what kind of blew everything up. So that's what is the crux of your book is that the Battle of Crazy does not take place in the traditionally known site. But tell me why, why is that important? And how does that not just change the way that we look at that battle, but also the way that we look at the in, more or less the entire hundred years war? So I have a number of things that I uh, am really kind of dedicated to, and my students get really tired of me hearing uh, or hearing me talk about. Uh, one of them is a battle is its ground. You, you cannot understand the field of conflict until you understand the field. Uh, you know, everything that a, um, you know, a soldier is doing, especially, I mean, it's true today still, but, you know, especially when we get into pre-modern context, these, they didn't have, GPS or, you know, aerial recon or anything like that, you know, all they had was what they can see. And so when trying to figure out what happens on the field of battle, you, you need to be able to see that. What were the lines of sight, right? What are the lines of, of, you know, uh, retreat, uh, what are the lines of getting there? What are the lines of, of capability here on the field? What obstacles are there for these men? You know, what are they actually seeing? So a battle is its ground. If, if you're on the wrong ground, you don't know anything about the battle. Like, like you might as well be talking about it on the moon. It, 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 you've now completely destroyed whatever conclusions you were trying to come to. And the main conclusions, of course, that people have come to with Cray C is that you know, the French were stupid. Uh, these idiot French just getting mowed down for hours. Like, I don't know, like they're, they're orcs from Lord of the Rings or something like that. Just wandering into the line of fire. Uh, for hours and hours and hours because they're just too stupid to know any better, I guess. And, it, you know, and it's sort of that sort of tainted people's understandings of the rest of the conflict, the rest of the war. You know, well, the French are just stupid. And, and uh, so that's how it happens, you know. Um, which of course, always amuses me when to hear English historians say that to be like, you know, they won the war, right? Like, <laughs> y'all lost. And if they were stupid, what, what happened there? But, you know, the, the, the basic gist of, of understanding, you know, how is it that the French do lose this, even though they've got a lot more men, um, they should have won this battle. You know, how did they lose? What does that tell us about tactics? What does that tell us about strategy? What does that tell us about how everything's going to evolve from this point forward, uh, including all the way up to, uh, you know, to Agincourt, which you mentioned at the beginning, you know, that, that battle, what Henry V does on Agincourt, I'm, it's a book I'm writing right now. Uh, is entirely based on crazy. Like crazy is in his head, not the reality of crazy, but basically like the propaganda of crazy at that point uh, is in his head. So yeah, it it affects everything. And if we don't understand what actually happened there, uh, I think we have a real problem. 
And we can't understand it if we don't know where it was. Now, was it the uh, Bowman that... Uh... I know that Bowman were uh, very important in Agincourt, but uh, what in Crazy, Crazy, Crazy? Yeah. I, I keep yeah. butchering the word. I always butcher words around here, but but the would you say that the the Long Bowmen were the big factor, or so this is definitely the thing that the English like is that you know the idea that this is the Long Bow, this is the kind of coming out party of the Long Bow. The Long Bow had been engaged in other uh, areas, uh, in other fights along the way. And certainly previous to this in, in places like Scotland. Uh, but this is sort of the big, uh, the first big time you see this on the fields of France where, you know, kind of everybody's there and you get this huge thing and, it, and the longbow is a big part of it. And it, and it was. The longbow is a huge part of this. Uh, but it is not, you know, the longbow is not a machine gun. It's not, it doesn't have unlimited ammo. You can't just mow people down like, you know, it usually doesn't even kill a person. Like it's just, you know, the idea, the Hollywood kind of ideas of what the longbow can do are, are kind of silly. Uh, what this is much more a, the way I reconstruct it, you know, after, after doing my shtick on it. Um, the biggest thing here is uh, Edward III took a great position. Um, and the French king lost command and control. And if you are a leader on the battlefield and you lose command and control, like good things usually do not happen. And I think that's what, what we get here is a, is a kind of amazing storm of things going really well one way and really bad the other way uh, that, that enable this to happen. The longbow is, is a huge part of it, right? The longbow have a very large role to play in this. But I do think, you know, the work I've done is kind of pulled that back a little bit from the idea of, well, the English win because they have this technological advantage. They do have a technological advantage in that regard, but it's not that's not the big killer here. The big killer is other factors. Now, you were saying that the battle took place in another location. So wh when I was reading that, I uh, was reminded of, uh, and, and you're a medieval Middle Ages uh, fan, uh, the Battle of Tours, 732, between Charles the Hammer and... Uh, the Muslims who took over Spain, where they don't know where the battle is. And I, I don't understand. How can you not know where the battle is? I would think that oral history, they would say this is where the, the war was fought. So here we are now. You're saying that the um, that the, uh, uh, the the original documents, I don't know if you were looking at documents, but, but they're stating that it was in another location. So did anyone learn not to uh, state that the battle was one place? I mean, what, what's, uh, what do you say about that? Traditions are hard to shake. Uh, you know, somebody put a location on the map saying this is where the Battle of Crecy happened uh, in the 17th century. And everybody just kind of assumed that that was right. And if you get enough people repeating a lie often enough, people begin to believe that lie. Um, this is the way most things work. We can see it today in politics. You repeat a lie often enough and everybody's like, yep, that's just the way it is. You know, that's just the truth. And that's essentially what can happen in history, too, is is somebody makes an initial, uh, you know, assumption, a guess, whatever, whatever it is. And, it, and if all these scholars, you know, if nobody's like fact checked that right and, and, and found out for sure, and they just keep repeating it. You get to this point where there's this enormous weight of your received knowledge right well, well all of these historians can't be wrong um i was actually i was actually attacked on that once in a uh, fairly recently when i was talking about this stuff with a bunch of my colleagues and one of my colleagues i won't name him he, he said he said in the end the reason we know that that mike can't be right is because if he is that means we're all wrong and i was like i'm not Sure, that's the winning <laughs> argument you think it is, man. I think you just kind of just jumped off a cliff there. I don't, I don't really know what you're thinking. It, but, but I, but I get it at the same time, right? You know, you, you sort of as a historian are somewhat trained to build on the previous generations of work, right? You know, we know this. Let's build on that and get closer to, you know, finding out what happened. Uh, but, but that only works if the foundation is like is like good, right? You know, if the foundation is built on sand, not so good. 
and I and the more I got in this, the more it was like, yeah, this thing's all built on sand, and uh, and nobody's just bothered to check. I mean, and it really was shocking. There were some things that 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 we discovered that were, i you know, quote unquote, discover like that nobody had paid attention to. Um, I don't want to give people the impression like like this was Indiana Jonesing, you know, like in the temple, right? And I fought off some alligators to get this stuff. Um, just nobody had looked at this material. And, but even the material that was widely available, like said, basically, if you read the original sources, said it wasn't there. That that afternoon that we were at the uh, walk in the field, and I was, like I said, I was finally like, it's, God, it wasn't here. There's no way. I went back to my hotel room, and there was Wi-Fi, and that night, just Googling on the internet, looked up a dozen of the sources, the publicly available translations, uh and read them and i was like yeah it's, they they say it was somewhere else so i don't know what we're doing here uh you know obviously we got a lot more evidence than that at this point but um yeah there's just the weight of received evidence traditions are hard to shake like for anybody right well i think i think you might do uh, the world a favor if you uh discover write a book about where the battle of tours took place because i i certainly would like to know <laughs> well i got a few ahead of it uh you know i get these days I get, I get called in, uh, you know, to do conflict analysis, right. You know, like, take a look at this battle, take a look at that one. Um, you know, see, are, are we, are we in the ballpark? Where are we? I've never looked at tours. I don't know that we have, I don't think we got enough sources to even ballpark it, but I've never looked at it. So we'll see. So you, um, you write in your book pretty clearly that you're, discovery or yours and Kelly's discovery was a sad testament to how military historians do not walk the battlefields um, and relying on a term that you use pretty often in the book, Volgado, um, which is sort of where we are speaking of that Volgado and you sort of saying, you know what, screw it. Let's go, let's go walk this, you know, battle, supposed battlefield while we're out here. And then you wrote a case book on it, which really sort of dismantled everything that a lot of historians, top historians, believed about the battle itself. Was there ever a concern for you? This is sort of a personal question, but it was there ever a concern for you that is like, ah, eh, this is like accepted tradition, belief. I don't want to. I don't want to deal with the pushback or the blowback. Was there ever that thought? And if not, was there some blowback other than what your colleague said? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's been blowback. Um, it, you know, funnily, not, not as much on this project as on a different battle that I've done, the battle of Brunenberg, uh, which was fought in 1066. Um, you know, and that, and that one, when I started working on that and was saying, you know, I think you got, got, it was in this other spot, not where other people think, um, you know, that one I had, I had death threats, which was like hilarious. So I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not saying this is funny. Send me death threats. Like I'm not inviting this, but I was just like, seriously, this battle happened in 937. Like, like y'all, we don't have a dog in this fight. Why, why are we this upset? Um, I was that I'll answer your question in a second, but that, you know, last year, uh, I had a book come out about that never greater slaughter. And, uh, and somehow so, I must've said something in some interview where I mentioned this, that there've been these threats and somehow the wall street journal got a hold of that. And ran a, a, it was on a front page article uh, around this time last year. It was about the death threats over the location of the, the Battle of Brunenburg. And, I, and the whole thing just cracked me up because I kept thinking of the poor guys on Wall Street trying to figure out what the hell this meant for the market. Like, do we, do we sell? Is it, is it bear or, or bull? I, I don't know. Brunenburg, what does that mean? Uh, so, yeah, there, there are people that get really serious about this stuff and take it very seriously. So, you know, your question's a good one. You know, how much, you know, in, in my position, am I thinking about that? Uh, you know, the answer, to be quite frank, is not at all. Um, and this is, I, I don't know what to attribute that to, but I don't, I just don't really care. I, I, I want to get the history right. It's, it's not about me being right. I don't, I don't want to be right. I want to get it right. And if, and if getting it right means I'm wrong, great, we got it right. If getting it right means you're wrong, great, we've got it right. I don't, I don't feel better for having, um, you know, proven you wrong or something like that. It's not like a, it's not like a competition. It's just, 
we need to get this right. So, you, so no, I'd never really entered anything. The only thing that kept entering in my mind was, is there something I'm missing, right? Is there some, there's got to be some reason why everybody's bought this. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but people are respect have bought it. What am I missing? Like, and it, and it was this, uh, you know, the sort of self-reflection of, you know, surely they know something I don't, right? And it just became more and more clear. No, no, they don't. We're, they're just all assuming. Um, so no, I, I didn't really think about that much. Neither did uh, uh, Kelly DeVries, you know, who was helping with the project, um, or I was helping him, depending on how you want to kind of look at that. Uh, we were working together. Uh, you know, it didn't really enter that. It's in fact one of the reasons uh, he and I have done a number of projects together and and done really well is that we don't have that concern with each other either. You know, so uh, when, after I kind of finally said, you know, no, no, I think it happened in this other location, he and I went back together and walked it again. And uh, I've walked the field now 20 times, uh, but went back again with the aim, the express aim of let's prove me wrong. Like, let's, let's prove that this is not it. I, I've got this harebrained idea, it must be here. Let's prove it wrong. Spent all day walking that field in the in the sun, uh, trying to 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 prove it wrong and throwing anything you know at me and at my position that we could. Because uh, yeah, if I turned out to be wrong, like cool, we now know that that's not where it was, right? Uh, sort of like the Edison thing of figuring out how not to invent a light bulb before he figured out how to invent it. Um, that's that's how history should work. And uh, and yeah, in this case, I yeah I've got an alternate idea how this works but i i try to make this point in the book look i uh i don't know a way to disprove my position yet but i'm open to have it disproved right i mean that let's let's get it right i don't care i don't care where it is let's just get it right and the traditional site the volgato as i call it uh is isn't right i, I can't figure out any way for it to be right so yeah it's a that's a good question so when it comes to the battle itself, I mean, we are now looking at a completely different location with that. Um, we sort of reframe, like legitimately reframe um, how we view some of the, I guess, the figures in this fight. What are some of the things that we learn about um, King Edward, the uh, King of France, and then also the Black Prince and some of the other ones and the Genoans. Uh, when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, those poor Genoans. And it reminded me of the Seinfeld episode where he's like, oh, those poor Krakatoans. You know, so I was like, man, you know, brutal. But what do we learn about some of the, the figures in here that, you know, maybe we viewed in a different light? Yeah, when you when you actually get to the sources and and unfold them which is so much fun it's it's the part that i love the most right what evidence do we have it's a puzzle right you know what are the clues how do i put them together and part of that was this the site but yeah another part of it was the actions taken and and what that tells us about these people one of the one of the big legends you know for instance about this uh, about this fight at crazy is that in the front line, what we call the vanguard, Edward III puts his son, the, the Black Prince, so-called Black Prince. He's not called that yet, but we'll call him that. It makes things easier. Uh, the Black Prince is put in front uh, with, with the, the main men in the front line. He's 16 years old. He's, he's never been in a, a real fight like this before. Uh, he, he, to some degree, he's trained for this most of his life, but, but uh, there's a difference between training and experiencing on the battlefield. And uh, he's put in the front line and at one point, this is the kind of, this is the Volgado again. The Volgado is, he's in the front line and people start to worry. They're worried that he's, he's getting, he's hard pressed, as they would say, he's hard pressed. And so somebody runs to his dad, the King of England, Edward III, who's watching all of this from a windmill, which is probably correct. He's getting height in order to have command and control. And they get up there and they say, you know, my Lord, your son is hard pressed. Let's get him out of there. Uh, and he says, according to the Volgato, um, let the boy earn his spurs. Let, let, him, let him fight. Let him become a man. And earning your spurs is knighthood. And of course, there's all kinds of weird 
you know, what we would now call, uh, uh, you know, toxicity of this or whatever, like, you know, be a man. So, you know, let the boy earn his spurs. And, and so they were like, wow, okay. Except they're, they're still too worried. And so they run out, these, these guys run out anyway, disobeying the king. So, and they, to go help the black prince. And they instead find him lounging on mounds of the French dead that he's mowed down. This, this hero, this amazing 16 year old uh, lounging. And they're like, are you okay? And he's like, oh yeah, I'm just, you know, cracks his neck kind of thing. I'm just resting, you know, I'm just getting ready for the next wave. You know how it goes. Uh, and they're like, ah, he's a true hero. Uh, that's like, that's the Volgado story. Like reality, reality is yes. He was in the front line. Yes. Uh, also, he wasn't supposed to move out. That line was not supposed to move. They were supposed to receive the French. The entire tactics of the fight was that that line would hold in its position. The French would get mowed down on mass as they tried to reach the black prince he's basically bait and they get mowed down by the longbow and it was working for a big chunk of the battle until that front line charges forward into the french who's in charge of the front line the black prince is in charge of the front line so we have to assume the black prince ordered a charge into the thick of the french uh which at this point blows up the entire plan because you can't the longbow just can't shoot kind of willy-nilly into the melee you could hit the black prince and if like if you shot the black prince in the back with well, the longbow arrow you're like you're not gonna want to do that so he runs out and gets captured like we actually figure out he gets captured in this battle the hundred years war for for the the minutes that he was captured was over it was effectively over like this was it because you could get a little king's ransom for this whatever demands you wanted you could get and it looks like the only reason he gets away is because the French start arguing about who gets to claim uh, ransom over him, who gets to sort of claim the prize and, you know, succeeding people like, no, no, you're not high rank enough. I'll claim it. Right. I'll give you a little cut. But, and they're arguing and potentially even fighting over this. And it's that opening that gives him the chance to start trying to get away and, and some Englishmen to actually come and rescue him and drag his sorry butt back to the lines. Uh, that he had cost his father almost the entire thing. And we actually have in one of our contemporary sources, you know, talking about the King of England after the battle, uh, excoriating him publicly, uh, you know, kind of reading him his rights because, you know, dude, you, you blew everything. What kind of idiot are you? Uh, that, which is a very different understanding of what happened, but also kind of makes sense now of why we get that story about let the boy has earned his spurs because what we're getting is what, what we would now call spin, right? That, that there was this truth. No, we can't have that. We can't have that. We need to, we need to spin it because we don't want a story about how our 16 year old crown prince couldn't hold his water and screwed up the whole thing. Like we can't do that. We got to spin it. And, you know, the more you start understanding what's going on and getting seen the field of battle, walking it, the more everything clicks into place. And that's what we found, you know, I found again and again and again in walking the field of battle, uh, you know, to go back to your earlier question, of, of it kind of being sad how few apparently do. Um, when you're actually finally in what looks like the right spot, again, I, you know, I don't know, right, but you can get to a spot where it's finally like everything clicks into place. All these pieces suddenly come together to form a complete picture. And, and it may have been before that, that the Volgado or whatever, well, we'll ignore anything that anybody said who wasn't English. Right. And then we got a story like, yeah, but those other people were there too, man. So probably shouldn't ignore them. Like maybe we should take account of them. And it, and it's when you get to the right spot, everything clicks together. And that's usually when you think, yeah, I, I've got it. Like, I've got it now. Now, I know the, the question I want to ask deals with uh, a later battle. Um, I want to say it's Poitiers. Um, King, John the, yeah, King John the Second is captured. Why didn't the war end then? I know there was a ceasefire at that point, but uh, why? I mean, it, it went on. Yeah, so it 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 ends. It does end effectively. The Treaty of Brittany basically ends ends everything. 
um, it just restarts in seven years later, something like that. Uh, I'd have to go back. I wasn't prepared for that question. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's why I wanted to make sure that I, I, I mentioned that this was a later battle. I yeah, think this was like, what, thir uh, 10, 10, 13 years later when... Um, years later. 10 years, years later. later. Yeah. The Battle of Poitiers. Uh, and I know he was yeah, captured, but, uh, and I think Edward, uh, pr uh, the Black Prince was the one who captured him, but, uh, yeah, it's Edward Black Prince who captures him, uh, captures the King of England, which is, which is amazing. Is this just, um, is this just confirmed that, uh, peace is just a, uh, you know, a pause between war? Is that, uh, it, in the end, right? This is about, you know, it's about a struggle for power. And, and the thing you, you have to kind of think about is like, what is the Hundred Years War about? The Hundred Years War is about, it's, well, it's about economics. It's about lots of things. But the, the main thing that's, that's triggering all this is this claim on the throne of England or the throne of France by the throne of England. You know, the French king being captured doesn't really affect that, that claim, right? And, and unless the French are all, all, all decide, well, I guess you're the king now. King of England, which they're not going to do. Like that's right. not that's not the, the the solution there. But the flip side, if you know the Black Prince is captured, it's pretty easy to to extract the give up your claim uh, that is necessary to end the Hundred Years' War. That's a that's a pretty easy get, as opposed to again the flip side, which is well, we're not going to give the entire kingdom over to you. You can take the king. That's fine. We're not going to do that. So the Treaty of Brittany. Uh, resolves in a way that is horrific for the French as far as the amount of money uh, that they're supposed to pay to get the king back as far as the land that they're willing to give up. Um, but they don't give up all of France. And so there's still like there's still the problem. And and all it requires for, for things to get going again is for the French to get strong enough to, to push back against the English. And and that's in fact what you end up getting happening after after not too long. And it, and it really it's you know it's not that long after the French start pushing back that, uh, you know, that, that it's, that's almost over the other direction because the, the English get rolled back, uh, pretty, pretty darn quickly towards the end of the 14th century, um, sets the stage for Henry V and all that. You know, I know uh, the thing, some things that bother me is that, uh, history such as the hundred years war, isn't really that well known and it should, you know, I'm, you know, I think that more people need to know, about the war, uh, as well as even the Thirty Years' War, and um, but uh, in terms of let's say I want to bring up movies because I know movies is one way for people to understand w conflicts and to understand wars a little bit. Are are there any are there any battles, any wars uh, that you can think of that are portrayed in movies so that people will get a better understanding and a better appreciation of the Hundred Years' War? Uh it's a good question. Uh, I usually no uh, is the answer. Um, usually because they're not gruesome enough. You know, when you when when you're dealing with pre-modern conflict, the 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 graphic horror of the whole thing is not something we should want to put on screen. Like it's like that's not it's not good for people to kind of not good for the psyche or whatever, right? It's, it's traumatizing to imagine uh, and, and to kind of know what it's, what it's like, right? Because most of this is, is melee fighting, right? You know, you're close enough to hug, hug the other guy. Like that is, that is rough. And the, you know, the, we get instead in the movies, right? You know, I shoot an arrow and it, and it goes, it goes through your, your plate armor, right? Inexplicably. Uh, and you fall off your horse and you're dead. Uh, and that, Nope, that's not what happened, right? Right. The the reality is maybe it knocked you off your horse, uh, and then somebody on the ground pulled essentially an ice pick and and popped your artery and let you scream out, you know, as you exsanguinated on the field, like that. You know, that's that's not fun film. Uh, so you really don't get any versions of of fighting on film that are that are that are are right. You'll get things that are sort of close in elements of it. So for example, uh, in game of Thrones, um, there's the, uh, uh, I want to call it the battle of bastards. Um, and the, and the press of, of humanity and the melee there's 
all kinds of stupid things happen tactically that are nonsense in that. But at a certain point, there's the, the just the press of of fighting is so uh, so tight that the the main character you're viewing all through, uh, John Snow, um, is suffocating. He's 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 suffocating in the press, and he actually kind of crawls kind of up to gasp air in the middle of the press and they have an overshot of it. I, I, watching that, I was like, that's that's pretty good. You know, the the chaos of it, you know, who's even on my side, you know, the uncertainty of that and the the horrible press of it. I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty good. That feels pretty medieval. Um, you know, the fact that he's not wearing a helmet is suicidal and stupid, but you had to see the actor's face, like that kind of nonsense. And, and there's there's you know dumb things that are happening strategy like that would never happen that would never happen, but but that that moment felt fairly good for uh, felt bad right but felt fairly accurate uh, to to kind of the reality of of, uh, of medieval history uh, because again I I just don't think we you know producers want to or in a sense maybe should want to get it right it's it's just not. It's not a good thing to, to see your experience. Well, we mentioned Braveheart at the beginning of this discussion, and um, I hates it. That one, <laughs> well, you know, some of the battles, although they were uh, historically inaccurate, for me, that was probably the. And, and you can correct me on this one. For me, it was the best thing I saw for a medieval battle. So, I mean, it it was you know Braveheart stuff is is just so hard to get over all the ridiculous stupidity that they do right you know the the length of his stupid sword uh you know which like nobody's got a sword that long that's they're basing it off the the sword and that's in the sterling uh museum uh sterling bridge uh which is which is two swords that have been forged together like point to point to try and make a ridiculous sword which is honestly making up for something uh, you know it, there's so much dumb stuff in that movie uh painting painting up like soccer hooligans and it's the battle of sterling bridge without a bridge i don't like or a river like they just like it's in a field you yeah, know, like just a... so many things were right it's so hard for me to kind of get over that um it, it does have the in moments again that kind of chaotic uh that chaotic feel and i and i think up to that point in hollywood was probably you know kind of up there as far as one of the best things you know, quote unquote, uh, of, of representing reality, uh, you know, that have been, and been up to that point. Well, I have to, I have to say, I kind of feel for you because I'm a big uh, fiend for the Trojan war. And when, uh, and the, the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, when I saw Menelaus getting killed by Paris, I, I, I got pissed. I'm like, what is this? No, that's not how it went. That's not how it happened. And, and that 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 ruined it for me. And then the rest of the movie, I don't know where the hell, I don't know who the hell they had as consultants, but uh, they all needed to be fired. I should have worked for them. Well, so I mean, the thing on that, you know, you, you do have to understand this. Historical consultancy is not, is not what anybody thinks it is. It's it's uh, it's you get a, an email or a phone call. You know, you're sitting here in your office, you get a call, and they say, yeah. So um, which of these? Do I'm sending you three pictures of doors. Which one's right? And and you look at the three pictures, you get like none of them. Uh, yeah, none of those are within three centuries of what we're doing. Like, what do you? And they're like, yeah. So we start shooting in five minutes. Which which one? Um, and so you're like, well, <laughs> that one. <laughs> and and you know, it's of the you're taking the least worst choice. Uh, you know, because nobody really wants to listen to the historical advisor. They don't. They don't really want to. Like, you're there so that. You're there so that they can point to somebody to blame in the end. So yeah, be careful what you wish for, man, about being a historical advisor. Be careful what you wish for. Well, I, I hope they hire you and put you in charge. So here you go. <laughs> uh, you hear that Spielberg? Get me in. Yeah, exactly. But then there's a good chance the movie will never be made. Yeah. So. Yeah. Damn it. Well, hey, Mike, this was a great conversation, man. I, I know that we could talk for probably another hour uh, on just a, a lot of the questions on not just this battle, but 100 Years War. But you you said that you have, you're working on another book, you said uh, on Agincourt, is that correct? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually working on 
on two books simultaneously right now. Uh, one is on the Battle of Agincourt, uh, 1415, Henry V, Once More Into the Breach, Band of Brothers, all that sort. Uh, I'm finishing that up right now. Uh, and then I am working on with, a, with another colleague of mine, Mike Cole, a book called The Killing Ground, which is a biography of Thermopylae. So what we do is we basically take the, the battleground, this kind of grows out of my you know, battle is its ground. You know, let's let's understand that that ground uh, and follow it from you know the 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 three hundred as it were the Spartans in four eighty BC. Um, there weren't three hundred Spartans, or there were a lot more than that, but be it as it may, uh, that that thing, that event, that big story, and let's start there and then follow all the because there's dozens of battles that happen there, all the way up to a Nazi tank battle in World War II. It's it's insane the amount of blood that has been shed in that spot. And let's look at it, you know, again, as a, sort of a biography of the place. What can we say about the ground? And then really, like, how conflict evolves over the centuries on this same, it's the same battleground, essentially. Like, but now there's gunpowder. What happens, you know, because we're fighting in the same spot? How does that change tactics and strategies and such? So yeah, I'm working on both those books uh, kind of simultaneously, which is interesting. Um, certainly makes makes for a fun a fun work day to be switching back and forth between all these things. But but yeah, the immediate you know sequel, if you will, uh, to Crazy Battle of Five Kings is is going to be uh, Agincourt Battle of the Scarred King, uh, which is which is yeah uh, Agincourt and is and is referring to the fact that. Uh, Henry V, when he was 16, uh, takes an arrow to the face at the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403, uh, takes an arrow to the face six inches deep into his skull. Uh, he takes an arrow and survives. And uh, so that's actually where I just I start the book there. <laughs> here we go. Shots fired, people. Let's go here. Beautiful. When do you think that's going to be finished and out? Uh, it's due next month. So uh, it'll be out. It'll probably be out in about a year. So yeah, probably October, September, October next year. Um, I'm really excited for people to read that one. You know, Agincourt, Agincourt is the more, more famous battle of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, it's one of the main ones people, people know about and, and think about. And, and it is, uh, again, very much un- misunderstood uh, is what, I've, what I have found. Now, it's not, it's not so much that it is mislocated the way Crazy was. So it didn't quite happen where everybody's got it, but it, it's not as far off as, you know, crazy was off by miles. This is not like that, but, but what, uh, what is transpiring there and why, you know, the actions, why does the English win? Why did the French lose? All that is, is quite different uh, in, in many respects. So uh, yeah, I'm, re- I'm really looking forward to that one. That one getting out. People have enjoyed crazy. Uh, I think they're going to enjoy Agincourt. All right. I want to ask you before you go, um, did yeah. Henry, did Henry V make the famous, uh, speech, um, St. Crispin's day speech as portrayed in the Shakespeare, uh, uh hell no, he did not. He did not. <laughs> so, yeah, sh- I, so are you saying Shakespeare came out with a whole band of brothers speech? <laughs> I'm saying that, that Henry V did probably not, probably did not speak in iambic pentameter. I think, you know, he was he was a groovy guy in many ways, but but popping off in in uh, in poetry, uh, especially that good. God, that's a good speech. So bloody good. Uh, yeah. No way in hell. I, I mean, he gave a speech. I'm sure. Right. You know, to the 40 people around him who could hear it. Uh, but uh, but no, not not that speech. Uh, it, uh, it, it was a gr- it was a damn good speech. I, I rate it. I rate it up there with Thomas Paine's uh, The Crisis. Uh, these are the times uh, that try men's souls. <laughs> yeah, I you know I talk about that speech um, in the in the kind of prologue of the book because you know it is so famous and has such interesting repercussions over time and and it, and it encapsulates the Agincourt myth. You know we know that uh, uh, General Ismay on the on the eve of D Day essentially when they are making the final plans and they're all, all the leaders for the first time are gathered in one room. And it's the only time they're all gathered there together to do like, this is the final run through looking at the models and everything. Uh, he records in his, in his memoirs. And in that moment, I thought of 
Henry V at Agincourt. Like, like that. That's that's what on, is on these people's mind as they're about ready to go into D-Day, uh, Operation Overlord, and for good reason. It's such a good speech. It is such a good myth. It is such a like a momentous thing. So, so yeah, I I would love it if Henry V, you know, in this in the moment was like, you know what, this needs like fifty lines of iambic pentameter poetry. Boom, go. I'd love it if that was the case, but I'm I'm pretty sure not. Whatever he said was probably in French, and uh, <laughs> probably wasn't that probably wasn't that nice. But uh, Henry V is still a cool guy. I'm not not saying he's a bad guy, but but that's 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 Billy Billy Shakespeare came up with that one. Yeah. He might be going someplace awesome. that that William Shakespeare guy. He he might he might have a career. Oh, pulling in the old anchor man Billy Shakespeare. Well done. <laughs> um, yeah, when I when I think of Henry V possibly doing a, a speech before Agincourt, I like to think he just went out there and said, "They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom." Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ouch. ouch. Oh. You're le- you're very welcome, Mike. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, the book is Cressy. Uh, Crazy Battle of Five Kings. That's Michael Livingston and Lord Willing. And the creek doesn't rise. We will have him hopefully on our show next year with his new book. Mike, thanks so much, man, for spending so much time with us. This has been fantastic. I don't know if you've ever got this, and I don't know if Alan picked this up, but I was like, man, he sounds exactly like somebody I sort of know. You sound exactly like Dan Crenshaw. Um, not to get political, but you guys, you guys could like talk for each other. It's crap. Yeah, put an eye patch. I want to, I want to <laughs> say something real quick before, uh, before we go that, uh, I have, I've read a lot of history books. Y- yours is, is, um, you know, and I don't sit and say what's the best, what's, uh, but I, I want to say that your book, I, I put it up there in terms of like readability that, that you don't get stuck and think, damn, I want to finish this book, but this book sucks. Yours is going to be up there with your uh, David McCullough's, your Alex Kershaw's. There's, there's a lot of uh, good, great authors out there, and yours was easily, I could, I could read it. And the only thing that kept me uh, from continuing was that I took an Ambien, and I don't remember a damn thing after I take one of those things when I go to bed. So, there you go. <laughs> you're very, you're very kind. Thank you, uh, thank you, and and. Uh... Uh, yeah, I, it's it's just it's fun to do this stuff. So I, I very much appreciate the kind words. And well, we're looking forward. Uh, yeah. Next time I'll we're wear the eye patch for you. Yeah, yeah. Wear oh, the, yeah. Wear the eye patch. We're looking forward to your next book. Thanks, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys. All right, man. We'll take, take care. care. Have a good one, man. All righty. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you enjoyed that conversation. Um, I know that I did. I'm quite certain that Alan did. It's always, I mean, the guests that we have on this show are always just full of great information and lightning. And unfortunately, I mean, we can't do like a, a post conversation about the interview just due to a lack of time. So Alan, what do you think about jumping right into our book and movie recommendations? Yeah, I'm ready to go. I got my books. Uh, don't have the movies, but I do have the books. So all right, well, let's get to it. All right, well, my book and movie recommendation, uh, my book recommendation is an obvious choice. Um, Michael Livingston's latest book, Creasy, Battle of Five Kings. Very much enjoyed it. Uh, Sort of blew my mind on just really how, um, I guess, just things that are repeated, 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 and then come to find out, it's like, uh, maybe we need to relook at the things that we think that we know about specific things in history. Um, and it's crazy that this is, you know, seven, 800 years uh, in the past. And we now need to relook at the way that uh, we've always looked at it. So if you want, uh, you can also check out my review on this book. Uh, you can check that out at theepictimes.com. My movie recommendation is not really a movie recommendation, but it sort of is. But, um, primarily because it's, sort of set in between, sort of during the Hundred Years War, 1357. But it's a time travel movie called Timeline with our good buddy Paul Walker and Gerard Butler, Billy Connolly, Francis O'Connor, and Michael Sheen. Sorry to go IMDb Allen version on you. Um, Actually, not that great of a movie. Um, Actually, a very terrible movie. Um, And it gets a ton of historical stuff 
wrong. In fact, this was the movie that caused Michael Crichton to say, you know what, I'm not going to really sell off any of my movie rights anymore without having almost complete control over what goes on. But speaking of Michael Crichton, uh, you should actually read the book timeline um, because there's a lot more historical accuracy in that book than definitely the movie. The movie is, I mean, it's cool, but historically accurate, no. All right, that's it. Um, the, I'm, you know, I was looking at uh, at, at the, the people who endorsed this book. Dan Jones, who wrote the book, The Plantagenets. I have that book. I have that very book. Um, and then Mike Cole, I've, I've heard about his book, Legion versus uh, the Phalanx. So um, it, it's, it, I, you know, this was actually a quite easy read. I didn't sit there and stumble with, with things that uh, makes a lot of reading difficult. So highly recommend that book. Now, uh, in terms of movies, I have a couple of them. I have uh, Henry V. Now, we're talking about the one that came out in 1989 with uh, Kenneth Branagh. Uh, the, uh, that movie takes place during the Hundred Years' War. It's later on, Battle of Agincourt, um, but it's still the same war, the Hundred Years' War. Um, and you have a, you have the, what's that Christian guy's name? The one that was in Batman, Christian, not Slater. Bell. Hmm? Bell. Christian Dale, Bale? Christian Bale, yeah, Bale. there's a young Christian Bale in that movie. So, uh, um, yeah, that was a Hundred Years' War battle. Now, and the other one is called A Knight's Tale. Now, in that one, who makes a cameo? You have Chaucer and you have the Black Knight. They're both uh, they're both in that movie. It's it's a Heath Ledger movie. It's it's a it's a funny humorous movie. Uh, but the whole time it takes place during the reign of Edward the Third. So, um, you know, then that was when the uh, Hundred Years' War took place. So both they're both entertaining movies. You know what's crazy is that it's Batman that brings us all together. You mentioned Christian Bell and Heath Ledger, Batman and the Joker. Whoa. Wow. You know, Hello. that's that's almost yeah. spiritual, man. Hey, this ale is this ale's to you, man. Yeah, that L that L is working. All right, man. Well, hey, it's uh, it was a great conversation. It was good to be back in the studio called my office uh, and your office. Um Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. Hope that you subscribe wherever you watch or listen. And hey, we'll uh, we'll talk to you next week.